Sit right down and I'll show you where my dreams began. I'm Michael Dugan, your culinary host, guiding you through the chef's journey. Join me at the chef's table where you'll experience stories, secret sauces, signature dishes, and kitchen disasters. In this episode, we take you behind the scenes for a delightful conversation with Carrie Dugan, my wife and the co-creator of Voice for Chefs. She created the Voice for Chefs experience through a company, Bigger Ideas. You've had bigger ideas long before you knew me. How did this company evolve? Bigger Ideas was formed 20 years ago. And when I went to register the domain, Big Ideas was taken. So I went bigger. It was also in line with my vision to create experiences for people taking them to the next level in their business. There's a powerful synergy between cooking and design because both are fulfilling human needs. I remember when I shared a story of how I was studying to be a chef and you said I was an artist in the kitchen. I never made the connection until that moment. It's ironic we met over a bottle of alcohol that we never drank. It was like magic. Our whole wedding in Italy shortly thereafter unfolded. Michael, I know it seemed like such a coincidence to you, but like most women, I had about 50% of the wedding already planned in my head before I brought you into the conversation. I've known you for 17 years and that you don't like to cook. I don't get it. Tell me and our listeners what the root cause is. My motto is to always stay hungry. Cliché recipes actually make me sad. I get jittery when I spend too much time in the kitchen. But it wasn't always that way. When my nose barely reached the table's height, I was experiencing food built around creativity and flavor. My mom, who grew up in an orphanage, would often go without food many times in her life, but she made a special sacrifice for my sister and me, taking us out to eat at different restaurants every weekend so we could try new foods and practice our manners. By age six, I had already experienced abalone, baked Alaska, and lobster. My sister and I became little walking food critics during the week, trying it all costs to avoid those awful school lunches while staying hungry for the next weekend food adventure. But as you know, being a foodie doesn't mean you can cook. It's only my sister that inherited that gene, as you know. Yeah, Colleen is an amazing cook. I would even call her a chef. She's never been to cooking school. But what she creates, usually even the first time she tries a recipe, it's perfect. I think, and I think you agree with me, that she should open a bakery. And if she did, she would have a line outside the door of people waiting to taste her cookies, her cakes, and desserts. Absolutely. She's a great baker and cook. But for me, it was only around college time that it was the first time I had to cook. So I became a chore worker for Olive, who was 95 years old and a ward of the state. It was a reasonable situation for both of us, uh, having me live with her so she could remain in her home, and for me having a job while I went to college. I think she put up with me, but... She saw me as this young, inexperienced girl who invaded her life, her home, and her kitchen. Not knowing how to cook, I tried to make her the best meals I possibly could out of a single beginner cookbook I owned. I think it was Betty Crocker. And with the worst possible ingredients, because she was poor. 
It was not only a humbling experience to ride my bike and wait in line at the White Center Food Bank, but also a terrifying one in the most dangerous part of the city at the time. I was all alone. As I gathered up staples that weren't even edible, I stopped going there and vowed to do whatever I could do to give her healthy food. Every week, I took money out of my meager salary from the state to buy her healthier ingredients for these recipes. Despite my efforts, my meals never tasted half as good as the recipes looked. Sometimes at meals, there were moments that made their way through her dementia, where she shared stories of her life, especially the ones coming to Seattle the day after the Great Seattle Fire of 1889, and It was her stories that made me feel less alone. So resourcefully, I took to growing a large, sustainable garden in her backyard, which actually was almost a half acre. When her social worker made visits, I went to my room, but I could still hear their conversation between the thin wallboards of the old and dilapidated house built in the early 1900s. That girl, her cooking is awful. For every meal, she makes me a plate of cold mashed potatoes, a piece of bread, and a pickle on the top. No, no matter how many times I heard her say this, my heart would drop to my stomach. Like those bricks of cheese from the food bank, those words came crashing down on me. The social worker, who obviously could see how well she was cared for, would always knowingly wink at me before she left. At least someone knew I, how hard I was working. After my job ended with Olive, I sacrificed my only cookbook to the gods by donating it. I've always been a fan of Greek mythology, and somehow this felt like an appropriate action since I had no luck in the kitchen. There was no great god for cooking per se, but Hestia is the closest one being the goddess of the hearth. Back in ancient times, each city had a public hearth that was sacred to Hestia. The fire kindled there was never allowed to go out. I learned firsthand to rise above challenges, even in the kitchen. From that point on, and without my only cookbook, my microwave fueled my culinary fire in my new apartment. This truly was one of the toughest and most pivotal moments of my life. But what would life be without struggle? In my mind, there is no level of need that should prevent you from giving to others. Jack London gave us an elemental survival advice. A bone to the dog is not charity. Charity is a bone shared with the dog when you are just as hungry as the dog. Here's when it all came together for me, Michael. As an adult, I always wanted a guy to say those three magic words to me. I brought food. And then one day it happened. I learned that food always comes to those who have husbands who can cook. You and I have strong passions around cooking. You love it, and I hate it. In my mind, there are only two food groups, happy meals and sad meals. And you know where mine usually fall in that second camp. But we do share that passion and love for good food. Food has become our connection in the tunnel of travel and adventure. We have many stories about travel and food, but one in particular stands out to me. We traveled four hours up a tributary deep in the Amazonia on the edge of civilization in Peru. The jungle lodge was primitive, but remember those people and the food that completely immersed our senses? We were invited by the lodge workers to travel 
to a neighboring village upriver with them to cook breakfast, something they did consistently every week for the young school children who lived there. Their parents survived on pennies a day. We noticed the children were dressed in dirty and ratty clothes and didn't have a single school book. And as we were helping them serve this meal, you and I looked at each other and felt the same thing. There was a lump in my throat I couldn't swallow and a tear I had to push back as it reminded me of Olive's food insecurity. But it was in that moment that I realized a gift of food is often stronger than any spoken word. Food is full of emotion. Michael, you are an amazing chef who always keeps me guessing at what you'll conjure up next. You are a magical artist in the kitchen. When I feel the kind of passion you have, it's easy to design a logo to match the desire and goal you have for your podcast. Stay hungry to feel the emotion of food. Well, thank you, Carrie. Now I have a better understanding of where this deep-rooted frustration you have with cooking is. But I would like to say one thing. In our marriage, I brought food. Tell me about the best meal I ever cooked for you. Right. Speaking of bringing food. So I remember one birthday you had planned for me to escape to get a massage and you were at home cooking this fabulous dinner for me of steak Oscar. I was mostly vegetarian, but this was an exception. I'm a vegetarian except for when I'm not, I guess. That was one time where I'm not. Sure. And you had the flu and steak Oscar, I remember was this really great cut of steak and it had crab on it and it had a tarragon hollandaise sauce. Tarragon hollandaise. And it was Dungeness crab from Seattle. And it was one of the best meals I've ever had. But it was also the loneliest ones because after you finished cooking, you went straight to bed. I remember that meal was delicious. Even though I was sick, it was really tasty and I was really exhausted. <laughs> but I was so excited to cook that for you. Let's step it up a little bit. Tell me about a time you had a kitchen disaster. I can think of a lot of them, <laughs> but along the lines of the story I just told you about Olive, one meal I tried to cook for her was fish and chips, homemade fish and chips. And every time I would cook in her kitchen, she would sit in a rocking chair and rock and watch me cook and mostly laugh at me. This time I had heated the oil, on, a pot of oil on the stove and I didn't realize how hot the oil was. So I was standing back about four feet trying to show or trying to throw the fish into the pot. It could have been a really huge disaster. I could have burned the house down. It was disaster enough of how I had to prepare it. And she was in her rocking chair laughing at me, and rightly so. That does sound like it could have been a horrible disaster. I know that I love to follow chefs, but do you follow any chefs? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I follow you to the kitchen every time you cook. <laughs> oh, yeah, I guess, that, I guess that's true. And, you know, I really do love to cook for you. I love to create and come up with really outstanding meals. It's not always easy because maybe you don't like to cook, but you're a good food critic. I would give you that. So along that line, what are your top three cookbooks? Top three. Okay. I told you I had one and that was <laughs> donated <laughs> for the, to the gods. Uh, I would say I've had a couple of them. I never look at them. I look at the pictures for inspiration mostly. There's one my sister bought for me that was five ingredients in 10 minutes. Um, that still didn't work. She thought these were non-fail recipes, but they did fail. Uh, so that was two. And then I do have an Italian cookbook or, or baking book. I like the challenge of reading it 
You have to translate it, don't you? Yes, I from do. Italian <laughs> to English. Yes, I do. <laughs> I think I remember you cooking a couple things out of it, but I will tell you, it has some beautiful pictures of Italy. It does. So we've traveled all over the world and tasted some amazing food and been to some amazing places. But what would you say is your favorite? I have so many favorites, but I think for me, food is not food. It's it's the experience. So I would have to say it was the restaurant that was attached to the hotel that we stayed in in Gravina when we were married. And they did our our wedding dinner for five hours. It was called Madonna della Stella, which means mother of the stars and the food was was the best we've ever eaten on the most special day of our lives. It was really tasty. We had five amazing friends plus the chef and we ate for five hours and we drank with Father Joseph. Father Joseph was a hazelnut liqueur, right? Yeah, typically they have gigantic weddings in this town and they have like a 2000 year old tradition of it. So everyone in the town followed us to the church, even though there were only five guests and it was just a tradition that they did. They follow the wedding party. And I remember we couldn't invite very many people and they were all standing outside of the door like they wanted to just barge in. We, we were the first Americans that were ever married in this town. So let's move on and tell me the best place you've ever eaten gelato. Well, again, it was in Italy. My sister went to school there and I went to visit her when I was 21. And she took me to a gelato restaurant that was 31 flavors, I suppose, uh, named after <laughs> Baskin and Robbins, but it was nowhere near the level of Baskin and Robbins. It was just elevated 10 times, 100 times from that. And it was right off the Ponte Vecchio. Really, it was hands down the best gelato I've ever had had. And, and that's where I took you to when we went to Italy the first time. I would say for me, that was a magical moment tasting gelato in Italy. I will never forget it. And I'm really grateful that you shared that experience with me. I wanted to give you that gift, that experience. What would you say your favorite desert <clears throat> island dessert would be? Desserts are my favorite. I have so many. Usually it's cakes, frosting, cupcakes are my favorite. Cupcakes. I think we had cupcakes at our wedding. We did. Well, I know that we had cupcakes that year and the year after and the year after. <laughs> so I would say that cupcakes are your favorite. Well, Carrie, I want to thank you for being our guest on Voice for Chefs and for being the creative influence and support for me and the podcast. Thank you, Michael. It was a pleasure to be your guest. I have to leave right now because the vegetarian lasagna is ready in the microwave. Ooh, that sounds really tasty. Thanks for joining us today. Follow us on Facebook. Find our website in the show notes. Subscribe on Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you listen. Leave a comment with five stars and stay tuned for the next episode of Voice for Chefs.